Okay. So here, let's talk about that fork sheet from yesterday. Because, oddly enough, the only way we can figure out what's happening with electrons is to study light. Okay? And to study light, you have to figure out what calculations and what we can figure out from light. Now, here's the physical problem in dealing with light. Okay? You have <coughs> one huge problem, and that's the speed of light is such a big number, which is 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Okay? So, like, for example, even if you look at, like, the distance to the sun, okay, it's a pretty big distance. When the light leaves the surface of the sun, it takes about eight minutes for it to get to us. Okay? So if the sun, for whatever reason, went out, okay? Sun said, no, nope, I'm done. I'm not producing any more light, which would be bad. It would take us about eight minutes before we realize that. So the cool thing about light, though, and this is where you get into astronomy and, and kind, of, kind of becomes a little bit philosophical. If you look at stars that are like, we measure distance to stars in light years, okay, which is how far a beam of light travels in a year, hence the term of light year. So the nearest star is Proxima Centauri, it's about three light years away, okay? So what that means is that when you look at the night sky and you see light that's traveling from these distant stars, you're looking back in time. So if you could find a star, let's say you're 17 years old. So if you could find a star that was 17 light years away, if you're, when that light gets to you today, or let's say it's your birthday, you're turning 17, and there was a star that was 17 light years away, that light was emitted on the day that you were born, and it's just getting to you now, okay? So when you look at the night sky and you see stars, you are looking back in time. You are seeing the universe as it was at a certain previous point. So dinosaurs went extinct about 65 million years ago, give or take 10 minutes. And so if you were on a planet that was 65 million light years away, you would right now see what happened on the Earth to cause the extinction of the dinosaurs. So you, when you look at them, it gets a little bit philosophical, so you're always looking back in time. So for a, while, for a long time, they thought the speed of light was instantaneous because of the fact that it was such a big number. And that was a huge challenge, just being able to physically measure the speed of light. Long story, they set up a series of mirrors over a long distance, and one of the mirrors would rotate, and then they would, they would track the difference in when that light reflected off the mirror, went a long way away, hit a mirror, and then bounced back. So they were, that's how we were able to measure the speed of light. Because it isn't like, I can stand back here, Turn on, a, turn on a flashlight, and then time how long it takes for that beam of light to reach the back of the room, okay? It's not practical. So the speed of light, that's monumental challenge number one. Such a very, 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 very big number. <coughs> the other problem is just the opposite. <coughs> so when you go to measure the wavelength of light, visible light, for example, <coughs> And that's what I've got on the back of the sheet when you look at these wavelengths, okay? So these wavelengths are really, 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 really small numbers, okay? 10 to the minus 7th meters. So if you consider like a millimeter, okay? Like a millimeter, like the thickness of your pinky, okay? That's point zero zero one meters. Well, that's 1 point 10 to the negative third, okay? Now, imagine taking that distance and dividing it up even farther so you're down here to like 10 to the negative seven. So the wavelengths are incredibly small, okay? So that's a challenge. How do you measure a wavelength of that small? Now, the other challenge is, is that when you get to the frequency, oh, you're talking frequencies of 10 to the 14th, okay? So yesterday, that's why I did that demo, so Raman was sitting there struggling to count to like, you know, 60 vibrations in a second, okay? 
Ooh, that was a challenge, right? Excuse me, 60 vibrations in 30 seconds, right? That was a challenge. Now imagine trying to count 10 to the 14th vibrations per second. And this isn't 10 to the 14th vibrations over a year, okay? This is vibrations per second. So you have an extreme. So you have two extremes measuring the speed of light, which is a really, really big number. Trying to measure frequencies, which are really, really, really big numbers. And then trying to measure wavelengths, which are really, 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 really small numbers. So nothing in this makes the calculations easy. The other thing is that when you're calculating the energy of a photon, E equals HF, sometimes it's written as E equals H nu, okay? Nu is like the old style, or the most common way of writing it. Sometimes you'll see it written as frequency. So this number is extremely small, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds, okay? That's a really, 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 really small number. And so what that tells you, though, here's the importance of it, though. What it tells you is that's the energy in a single photon of light. This isn't like a whole beam of light, okay? This is just in one single photon. So this is a really, 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 really small number. But how do you determine the energy in a single bundle of light that you can't even see? It isn't like, oh, here's, we turn on the light and getting all these photons coming out of us. It isn't like we can sit there and go, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, that's how, no, it's an incredibly large number. So all calculations involving light and being able to measure them are extremely difficult to do because you're either dealing with numbers that are really, 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 really small or you're dealing with numbers that are really, 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 really big, okay? So if you look at like the history of science and calculations, you, lead, you read a science book from 100 years ago and you search for Planck's constant, can't find it, okay? You didn't know anything about it. Planck's constant did not exist 100 years ago. So in the history of, of science, and this all kind of came together all at the same time. So what they figured out is you can take light and break it up into different parts. So what I have here is, and I'll turn out the lights. So this appears, turn out the lights. Okay. So this appears to be a white light. Okay. Not a big deal. But if I take this thing, and I spin it around, now what happens? What do you guys see? Red, blue, and green. You see red, blue, and green. But if I stop it, <coughs> it goes I can back. I can still kind of see the green. Yeah, you kind of see a little bit of a flicker, but certainly not. Yeah. Okay, now what's weird is that if you, flat, if you blink your eyes sometimes really quickly, you can kind of see those. But here's the point. What this shows you is that light is made up of different things. So one of, the, one of the things they figured out was the ability to take light, white light, and separate it into its individual components. So this situation, what we're doing is that we're spinning it around to show you that that white light is made up of all these different colors. So the other thing that they did is they developed a prism. And what the prism does and we'll talk more about this later, this prism separates light into, it's like different components. It's a, major, it's a way of sorting. So once they figure out how to sort this out, then they said, okay, well, what, can, what information can we figure out about this light? And that's what the calculations came into. The whole equations, the, or there's a guy by the name of Maxwell. Maxwell's equations describe the electromagnetic theory. Okay, if you ever get a chance to study them, they're horribly difficult math, but they're really, really cool. So Maxwell's equations basically said, hey, here's what we got. He actually predicted the speed of light before they were actually able to measure. So here's what I want you to see. And here's the heart and soul of this. So I want to make sure everybody's cool with this first answer on number one. So on number one, you have the speed of light equals wavelength times frequency, which is the same thing as wavelength times f, okay? This is the Greek letter nu, it just means frequency, okay? So nu 
and letter F mean the same thing. It's how many vibrations per second are taking place, okay? So on these, I've given you the wavelength. So you're gonna take 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, and you're gonna divide that by one and a half meters, okay? Now, I beg of you, and as I've preached to you from the very first day you've been in this class, you have to pay attention to the units. This is just not putting numbers into a calculator, okay? You have to understand what this is telling you, okay? If I just wanted you to crunch numbers, I teach math. I want these numbers to have meanings. That's why I teach math, what I call it chemistry, okay? So if you notice what happens, the meters are going to cancel out. You're left with units of one over seconds, and that's what frequency is measured in. So there's like three primary ways you can express units of frequency. You can write them as hertz. You can write them as s to the negative one. You can write them as one over seconds. They all mean the same thing, okay? It's a personal preference in terms of what units you use for frequency. I don't care which one, pick one, okay? So what's gonna happen out of here, you should get 2.00 times 10 to the eighth hertz. They okay, said so that should be your answer to number one. When you're punching these numbers into your calculator, again, don't hit the times 10 key. You have to hit that EE key, okay? Do not type in times 10. If I were you all, you all have storage functions on your calculators, I would store that number, okay? That way you don't have to type it in every time. You can just hit recall and then I, I always store it as little as C because that's the speed of light, okay? I don't care where you store it. I just always store it as the speed of light as C. Now, what you should see, okay, as you go down from number one and then down here to number four, then that final answer on number four should be 3.33 times 10 to the 17th hertz. So when you're... What you want to look at here is this. This is a classic example of an inverse relationship between wavelength and frequency. So the whole point that I want you to see is that down here you end up that last come on, that last number is 9 times 10 to the negative 10. Okay? So what's happening is that you're starting off with a pretty long wavelength. That first wavelength is about a meter and a half, okay, which is about like this. Okay? By the time you get done, you have a wavelength that's probably a, a thousand times smaller than the width of a human hair. Okay? So you went from a relatively long wavelength to a relatively short wavelength. And what you should see is that your frequencies are getting higher. Okay? Because the whole point is that wavelength times frequency always equals the same number. So as one number goes up, the other number has to go down. Okay, so that's one of the most important things you have to get. Now, when you get to six through nine, six through nine, I'm doing the opposite. On six through nine, I'm giving you the frequency and you want to determine the wavelength. So again, this is where the magic happens. You're going to take the speed of light times 10 to the 8th meters per second, and you're going to divide it by, like for example, that first one, 9 times 10 to the 6th, 1 over seconds, or hertz. It means the same thing. So what's going to happen is that your seconds are going to cancel out, okay? You're left with units of meters. That's going to be the wavelength. So what you should see... <coughs> on six through nine, is that your biggest wavelength is gonna be there on number six, 33.3 meters. And that's, to give you some perspective, that's about the length of a football field, okay? So that's a really, really long wavelength, and that's like radio waves, okay? Those are, those are really, really, radio waves are really, 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 really long. Then you end up with a really, really, really small wavelength on number nine. So what, what I want you to see on this one is that I made the, way, the frequencies bigger, but then the wavelengths are getting shorter. Okay? Everybody cool with that one? Okay.
Now, on number 11, you want to calculate the energy of a single photon. Okay? Not the whole bundle of them, just a single photon. <coughs> so, on number 11, you're going to use E equals H times frequency, which is also written as E equals H nu. It means the same thing. So, this is just a constant. It's Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. Okay? So, all you have to do is that you're going to take on number one, you're going to take that Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds, and you're going to multiply that by 2.00 times 10 to the eighth, one over seconds. Now again, this is where the magic is going to happen. The seconds are going to cancel out because this is it has this weird kind of thing of joule seconds. So those are joule seconds. So then the seconds cancel out. You're left with joules. We know that's a measure of energy. Okay. So make the units work out. So what you should see on that first one, that's 1.326 times 10 to the negative 25th joules. Okay. That's a really, 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 really small number. Okay. But again, that's the energy in a single photon. This isn't the energy in a Mack truck, okay? This is the energy in a single bundle of light. And again, this is tough to measure. You're trying to measure something times 10 to the negative 25th, okay? That's a really, 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 really small number. But the beauty of it is, is that if you take enough of these photons, each one might not have very much energy, but if you have enough of them, you can produce a lot of energy. So this is what happens in a microwave, okay? Microwaves work because microwaves emit photons, okay? You can't see them because that isn't something that we can see. But if, you, but if you emit enough of these photons, you can make popcorn, or you can warm up your cup of water, you can whatever you want to do, okay? So if each individual photon doesn't carry a lot of energy, but if you have enough of them, then you can get a lot of energy going into this. Okay. So, the whole key to this is what I want you to see on number 12. As the wavelength gets shorter, what happens to the energy? So this is the thought process. As the wavelength gets shorter, frequency gets higher. Okay, higher frequency. But we showed that yesterday, right? Frequency gets higher. Then your energy is Planck's constant times frequency. Well, this number doesn't change, right? So what that means as your frequency gets higher, guess what? Your energy gets higher. That's it. That's all you have to see. So then on number 13, you're going to calculate those. So on 13, that first answer should be 10 to the negative 27th. And that second energy should be 10 to the negative 21st. Again, extremely small numbers. But, and the whole heart and soul again, again is number 14. As the energy, as the frequency increases, what happens to the energy? Oh, I'm multiplying a number by a bigger number, energy is going to go up. <coughs> so here's the heart and soul that I want you to see. Okay? As you increase wavelength, you decrease frequency. As you decrease frequency, you decrease the energy. And this opposite happens. If you make the wavelength shorter, you make the frequency higher. If you make the frequency higher, you increase the energy. This is the most important thing that you have to understand going forward. Okay? Is that so if you can see the type of light that's being emitted, that's going to be a reflection of the energy that's involved. Okay? So if you can figure out the light, you can figure out the energy. Got that idea. Okay. Now, on the back side, okay? So I've given you some of the main colors of the spectrum. Red, orange, yellow, green, violet. Okay? So let's make sure this first column is filled out correctly. So when you look at red light, I've given you that 5.08 times 10 to the minus 7th meters. You need to calculate the frequency, so you're going to take the speed of light, divide it by that number. 
That should get you 5.905 times 10 to the 14th hertz, okay? And then that energy is going to be 3.92 times 10 to the negative 19th joules, okay? So that, that should be your first column across the top. That way you're going to know if you, got, if you did this right. So as you go down to violet, okay, violet light. So as you go down here, and you end up at 3.20 times 10 to the negative 7, okay? So miles. We're going to go from 5.08 times 10 to the negative 7 to 3.20 times 10 to the negative 7, okay? Is that wavelength getting bigger or smaller? Smaller. Smaller, okay? Because they're both in the same exponent, 10 <coughs> to the negative 7, right? So, as you go from red light to violet light, the wavelength is getting smaller, okay? Now, what's happening to the frequency then? Hey, wavelength is getting smaller. Wavelength, frequency is going to get bigger. So, as you go down here, you're seeing an increase in frequency and decrease in wavelength, okay? So, out. As the frequency is getting higher, what's happening to the energy? It's getting bigger, okay? So that should be the trend that you see on this chart, okay? So here's the point, is that if you can look at light, and you say, oh, right, if you see a certain color that's emitted in from a reaction, and you see red light versus violet light, red light is going to go, oh, man, that's, that's more chilled out, okay? That's lower energy. Then, if you have violet light, ooh, ooh, that's really, that's really a lot of energy. So this makes sense. And here's why this should make sense. I'm guessing at some point you all have had a fire, right? And you burn wood, charcoal, whatever, okay? Some type of <coughs> carbon-based fuel. As that goes burned down, what's the last color that those, color, that those coals glow? Do they glow violet, or do they glow red? red? Red. Okay. Why do you think the last color that they emit is red light, and not violet light? Easiest color. Huh? Easiest color for them to emit. That's right. Okay. It's the lowest energy level. If if green light was the lowest energy level, <coughs> this would be really weird. Coals would glow green right before they went out. So instead of saying, oh, it's red hot, we would say, oh, it's green hot, which seems really weird, okay? Or if violet light was the lowest energy level. Oh, wow, it's violet hot, okay? <coughs> oh, okay, it's red. So this is why if you look at like a, sunri or a sunrise or a sunset, the sun typically appears to be red, okay? It tends to have a reddish tint to it. And the reason being is that when you look at our atmosphere, so here's the Earth, and we have this little layer of air around us, which is kind of cool, otherwise we wouldn't be here having this discussion. So as that light goes through our atmosphere, so imagine Ethan's our sun, okay? So, and here we are in Mays, America. So if Ethan is our sun, directly overhead, we're looking straight up and we're seeing Ethan, okay? Now, if you look at a sunrise, so this is looking towards the east. So the reason sunrises and sunsets appear red is because if Ethan's our sun and it's sunrise, that light has to go through like almost parallel with the earth. So it goes through a lot more of our atmosphere. Red light, which has a longer wavelength, makes it through our atmosphere. The violet light, the higher energy levels get scattered off. Okay, so during sunrise or sunsets, this is why it appears reddish orange, because the red light and the orange light make it through because those are lower energy and longer wavelength. Now, when it goes directly overhead, you're not going through as much of the atmosphere because it's like a direct shot, okay, as opposed to going parallel with it. So that's why as the sun goes up, that's why it appears yellowish when it's directly overhead. Okay, so there's your little astronomy lesson how this thing fits in. So, 
when you get down to these bottom questions on the bottom of this second page, okay? So I'm gonna make sure everybody has these. So question number one, which has a longer wavelength? Red light, violet light. Keaton, red light, violet light. Which one has a longer wavelength? Uh, violet. You say that with absolutely no confidence. No, it's red, is it? No, it's violet. Red light. If you had it right the first time, you just didn't have any confidence in your answer. Okay? So red light has the longer wavelength. Okay? So Grace. Red light has the longer wavelength. Okay? So then it's question number two. Which has the higher frequency? Red light or violet light? Beautiful. Okay? Then here's the final kicker question. Izzy. Which has the higher energy, red light or violet light? Violet. Fantastic. Okay? So, this is what I want you to get. So, if you can figure out the colors that are being emitted, that's a reflection of energy. Okay? Got that idea. Fantastic. Any other questions on that worksheet? Got it? Good. Grand? Okay. So, get that handed in. Now, Miles, we've got to do some filming there around that center island. No. Big ideas that we've talked about are going to merge together. Okay? So, and again, you have to look at the history and, and where we are in history at this point. This is late 1900s, early 1920s. Okay? So, all of these ideas are kind of coming together all at once. So what they what the scientists developed was the ability to take light and separate it out into its different colors. Okay? We'll talk more about that later. And so they knew that energy was somehow involved in the emission of light and something had to be happening. Okay? So for example, a, a, a piece of wood is not going to emit light. But if you light it on fire and get it hot, then it begins to emit light. But okay, right. Okay, so somehow or another energy is involved in light. So at the time, they were struggling to explain the structure of an atom. They said they knew there was the nucleus because of Ernest Rutherford. They knew there were electrons because of J.J. Thompson. They initially had the Bohr model, which had, the Bohr model was when, you know, that looks like a little planetary system, okay? That kind of failed because the electrons shouldn't be stable. Erwin Schrodinger comes along and says, now nah, if you let it emit, if you let it travel in waves, and we can figure out a probability distribution, that kind of accounts for things. But they really didn't understand what the electrons were doing. So then this whole new branch of science kicked in, and it began to study light that was being emitted from atoms. And so the main idea is if you're going to have something emit light, and this makes sense if you think about it, two things have to happen. You have to jump energy into it and get these electrons, which are in the ground state, what we call the ground state. You can think of the ground state as being like the floor, okay, or a chair or a table, some type of tabletop, okay, it's ground state. So what you have to do is you have to take that electron in its ground state, because Mother Nature is a lazy prima donna, so Mother Nature isn't going to make these electrons move by themselves. And it's going to go from its ground state up to a higher energy state. At that point, the electron goes, this kind of sucks. I'm not taking it here. I want to go back to where I was. And then the electron comes back down. And when it makes that transition, it has to lose that energy. So it's kind of like me. Okay, so here's like the ground state, right? This is ground state. So let's say that I want to, this is much easier than I was trying to do as a demonstration. So here's the ground state, right? This is where I'm at. So if I want to move to a higher energy state, that takes some amount of energy. Okay, I had a cinnamon roll for breakfast, I got some energy, right? So I'm gonna move here to an excited state. Okay, and it's just like, well, this is kind of weird. Okay, I must—I feel much better 
when I'm down on that ground state. So when I do this, now when I land, I give off some energy that you all hear as sound. So what happens is that we make electrons do the same thing. So electrons exist in these, all electrons exist in some ground state. That's the lowest possible energy level because Mother Nature is the basic prima donna. So if I want to make that electron move, okay, I've got to put energy in and then it's going to come up here. Now, another possibility is that I might even go to a higher energy state. So let's try and do this without killing myself, okay? So here's one potential energy state I could be here, right? Now, I could also be here at an even higher energy state. Now, visualize this. I'm not going to do this because I don't want to break my legs. But let's say I have two potential things. I could jump from here all the way down to the ground, or I could jump from the chair all the way down to the ground. Which one's going to make more noise? From here down to the ground or from the chair down to the ground? From there down to the ground. Why? Because there's going to be more energy. Fantastic. So imagine that I'm an electron. Okay? Imagine I'm an electron. This is where this all is going to come together. I'm an electron. I have moved from the ground state up to here. I just, I, energy got put into it, right? Now, I can move from here all the way down to the floor, or I'm going to move from here, or I can go from here down to the floor. Okay? So those are the two potential energy transitions I could have. So I, here's my tabletop right? Here's the chair, and here's my ground state. So I can go from here, or I can go from there. Now, this is where it all comes together, okay? Table, down to the ground. Chair, down to the ground, okay? I'm an electron. When I come back down, I have to emit light, okay? This is where this comes together. Which transition, table to the ground, chair to the ground, would emit red light, and which one would emit violet light? Chair to the ground, is that going to be red or violet? Table to the ground, is that going to be red or violet? Wouldn't the chair be red? Why? Because it takes less energy to reach the Fantastic. So what this means, because that chair to the ground, that's going to be, we'll even, we'll even cover code this, okay? So that's going to emit red light, right? Because that's a lower energy transition. Now, so from the table down, that's going to be more energy. And so this is as close as I can get to violet. Oh, there we go. Proper violet. So that's going to be violet light. So notice I drew these differently. Why did I draw that violet light with shorter wavelength? It's a shorter wavelength. Because it's a shorter wavelength because it has a higher energy. energy and a higher frequency. So here's the deal. So let's say I'm going to shut out the lights. I'm going to shut out the lights. Hey, I'm not going to do this for any number of, any number of reasons, but visualize this. I want to make the room completely dark, okay? And all you're going to hear is the sound of me hitting the ground, okay? You can't actually see what I'm going to do. All you, <laughs> this is why I'm not going to do this, okay? Yeah, so, hey, call the nurse. What happened? We can't broke his leg. It's bad, okay? So I'm not going to do this. So I'm going to shut out the lights, and all you're going to hear is one of two sounds. Me hitting the floor from either the table or the chair, right? You can't actually see what's happening. So how can you determine which transition I make? What would you, which one's going to make more sound? The one at the table, right? So here's the idea. The bigger the energy jump is, the more, the bigger that energy transition is, the more energy is going to be involved in that transition. Okay? Got it. Great? Okay. Now, here's the weird thing. This is the weirdest thing of all. So if you look at like electrons, and, and this is why this all comes together. So you have like 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Okay? Which, which element is this, by the way? Carbon. 
What'd you say? Carbon. Carbon. Why? Six electrons. Yeah, there's six electrons. Which element has atomic number of six? Carbon. Okay, there you go. It's carbon. Okay? Add them together. Two plus two plus two, you get six. Okay? So this is what we call the ground state arrangement. Okay? So here it is in the ground state. So I give this thing some energy. Okay? Give it skittles. All right? I give the electron skittles. So then what happens is we go from 1s2, 2s2, 2p1, 3s1. Now, look at your, so here's what's happening on your electron hotel. I took an electron that was very happily existing in the second energy level, and I'm going to bump that up to 3s1. I still have the same number of electrons, but I took a 2p electron, and I moved that up to 3s. Okay? Now... Mother Nature goes, this is so not cool. So what's Mother Nature going to want to do? Look, what's Mother Nature going to want to do if I had an electron that's up there in 3S? Bring it back down. Bring it back down. <laughs> so then it's going to return back to this, 2P2. When it does that, what does it have to give off, Luke? Photon. Yeah, it has to give off a photon, right? So that might be a red light. Okay? All right. There's, the web. There's my red line. Now, the other option, let's do this. Let's live on the edge. So then let's say we're going to go and we're going to take one, uh, 1s2, 2s2, and then we're going to go to 5s2. Or excuse me, 2p1. I screwed that all up. I got so excited about going all, all the way up to 5s that 5s1. So now, instead of going from 2p to 3s, I'm going to go from 2p all the way up to that fifth energy level, okay? Huge jump of energy, right? Big jump, right? It's going to be huge. This is like me going from here all the way to the ceiling, okay? Big energy jump. So what's going to happen to that energy? Big energy, small energy. Ella, big energy, small energy. Big. Big energy. So this is going to produce really, 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 really short wavelengths and incredibly high energy. So this is what we look at. We can't see what electrons are doing. But if we can figure out the energy that they give off, we can get an idea of what's happening with the electrons. Now, here's the weird thing. This is the weirdest thing of all. Okay? So sometimes you see this drawn out like this. I'm talking about writing in red. Uh, so sometimes you see it shown like as a stair step. Like here it might be like your ground state. Okay. And then this is being like the first energy level. And then there's the second and there's the third. Okay. So you'll see an electron jump from here back down from here. Okay, things like this. You can make these transitions. Okay, imagine like you're on steps. Okay. But here's the weird thing. Is that the electrons don't exist in between these energy states. Like they do not exist. They're either at one energy state or the other. So it's just like imagine Luke. Luke right now is in his ground state. Okay? Basic energy level. And let's say at a higher energy level, Luke is playing sports. Okay? He's at another he's at another energy level, different plane. So maybe that's playing Xbox, whatever, playing, playing a video game. Here's the weird thing. We would see Luke here, and then all of a sudden Luke would disappear. And then Luke would appear again at a higher energy state. Okay? Luke would not exist in between. He would not move from one place to the other. We would not see him move. All of a sudden Luke is gone. Luke is appearing at that higher energy state. Then when Luke returns back to his energy state, Luke is going to disappear from playing games, and he's going to reappear over here. So when we talk about these electrons moving and making these transitions, they don't actually exist. They do not physically exist in between. It's not allowed. They're here. Boom, they disappear. They reappear in a higher energy state. It's like, okay, they don't like that. Boom, they're going to come back down. They're going to kick off that photon of light. Okay? So that's why it gets so weird on an atomic level. Now, let me show you what this looks like. So... Miles, just unplug that and then just hold it, and we're just going to go kind of here towards the back. 
So let me get this started and then I'm going to turn out the lights. So even if you look at burning. Yeah. So even if you look at this Bunsen burner, okay? So and we'll talk more about Bunsen burners when we actually get into the lab. So you notice that there is that inner blue cone, okay? And then you've got a different color out here. So with Bunsen burners, the hottest part of that flame is at the very tip of that orange, of that inner blue cone. That is always the hottest part. Now let's look at this. So here I've got this piece of metal. It's not emitting any light. Why? Where are all the electrons? Rhymes with round state. Huh? <laughs> How about ground state? Okay. So all the electrons in this metal are at the ground state. They're all just chilling out. They're happy. So I put this in here, okay, let it get hot. Now I take it out, notice it was glowing. Okay? So, but then it stops glowing. Why does it stop glowing? What do all the electrons do? Return back to the ground state. So I, I put energy into it, right? I get it hot. The electrons are flipping out. They're jumping in. They're excited. They're going, Wah! Okay, they're all hyped at this point. So they go, man, I'm not digging this. I'll go back to the ground state. So as soon as those electrons lose that energy and they come back to that ground state, it stops giving off energy because Mother Nature is the way she came it on. So this is the classic example of what you have to do to make electrons emit light. You give it some energy source, okay? Those electrons begin to move. They're jumping energy levels, but as soon as they all return back to the ground state, they're just chilled out. Now, do I want to touch this? No. no. So here's the thing. This is, still, this is still giving off energy. If I put my finger right here beside it, I can still feel that. So it's still giving off energy in the form of photons, but this is what we call infrared. That's heat. So this is still giving off photons, but I just can't see it. So when I do this, Okay, and get this thing hot. So for us to see it, that's a pretty big energy jump. At this point, it's still giving off photons, but they're so low of energy that we can't see. So what I want to do is I've got some different salts here. So for example, this first one is that will be sodium. Okay, so this is just like this is just powder, sodium, nitrate. So what I'm going to do is, hopefully, <coughs> this on this loop. I'm going to put that in there. Okay? So what I did is that I grabbed a little bit of this stuff. There's a few crystals on here. I want to put it in here. And notice that that gave a very distinctive yellowish color. So every element, when it's heated up, gives off a different, unique spectrum of light. So it's like a fingerprint, okay? So each element has its unique fingerprint in terms of how it gives off light. So sodium has a very distinctive yellowish color. Which is why, when I do this, you get that brilliant flash of yellow light. So what's happening is that the sodium atoms are sitting there, and they're cool, right? They're showing out. All of a sudden, bam! We hit them with the energy from the flame. Those electrons go, whoa! This is bad, okay? So you get so much energy, they jump up to the higher energy levels, they don't like it, they come back down, and they emit a specific color of light. What was it? Okay. Okay. All right. So that was... So, so now we'll look at copper. 
So with Hopper, <clears throat> okay, so here's copper. This is a pretty big chunk. More than I might have been. Okay? So notice with copper that. So, copper, when it emits light, notice that that was a completely different color. It kind of had like a, a, a bluish, greenish tint to it. So, the last one we'll do is strontium. So, strontium. Is that each element has its unique individual color that it's going to emit? Okay, each one has its own color. So if you don't know what that element is, one thing you can do is call it a flame test. Okay, and that will allow you to say, okay, hey, what's happening? All right, got that idea. Okay. Uh -huh. Up here. Here's, God, that made a lot of noise. Okay. Now, here's one of the great mysteries that occurred. Is that, again, you, it's handy if you, if you understand the sequence. Rutherford did his work, said, oh, here's the nucleus. All the little physicists in the world were happy. They said, oh, cool. We're going to let electrons move like 
planets because it was a model that they understood because they were all physicists they had all studied gravity okay problem is is that the electrons should all lose energy so basically if here's an electron as it goes around the electron should lose energy and then it should they collapse into the nucleus yeah that's all so they said okay well they, that obviously doesn't happen so then they began to look at light so you have two different types of light emissions so let me explain what this is so this is what's called a continuous spectrum so it's continuous oddly enough because there's no gaps so and here's what i want you to see in the difference between this continuous spectrum and this hydrogen spectrum so here's the deal if electrons could exist at any possible energy level from the nucleus out to the edge of their orbital. What that means is that those electrons could absorb or emit any type of energy. It's a, it's a continuous spectrum. So if you want to think of this in terms of like being like a ramp, okay? So imagine that from here down to the ground, instead of having me go from here to the chair to the ground, imagine that I have a ramp. So if there's a ramp, I could have infinite amounts of energy between the tabletop and the ramp. I can move a little bit, I can move a little bit more, okay? I could have all these different, an infinite amount of energy. So you would, instead of hearing just two distinct thuds, you could hear, a, you could hear an infinite amount of thuds, okay? Because I could have an infinite amount of energy as long as I went from here and I had a ramp going down to the ground. But what they, so if atoms had electrons that could exist in any possible energy level, every element would produce a continuous spectrum because the electrons could exist at, energy, at any energy level. Okay, so any, this is important. If electrons did not exist in distinct energy levels, every element, when you heated it up like that, would produce the same spectrum. Everything would look the exact same because the electrons could exist in energy at any energy level. So what they did is they took, like for example, this is hydrogen, which is one of the simpler ones. So what they did is they took hydrogen, and they took this light, and they separated it out into its colors. So we use what's called a diffraction grating, which we'll talk about tomorrow. So what diffraction gratings do is that it takes light and it separates it out. It's a sorting process. Just like if I gave you a collection of nails, bolts, and needles, and I said, hey, sort, sort these out. Oh, you'd go, oh, here's the nails. You could pick those out. Oh, here's the bolts. Oh, here's the needles, okay? You would separate those out. So what a diffraction grating does is that it takes light and it separates it out into individual colors. So when you look at hydrogen, so a couple of things I want you to look at. Notice that hydrogen has what we call a four light spectrum. So what that means is if you were to look at the spectrum of hydrogen, what you would see is that you would see one band here in purple, one like in this violet, one in the blue, and one in the red. Now, here's the deal. This is what I want you to see. Which one of these lights, violet or red, which one is representative of a bigger energy jump? The purple light over here or the red light over there? Which one has the bigger energy jump? Violet, red. Carter. Violet or red? Those are your choices, violet or red. Which one is the bigger energy jump? Red. Violet. I'm so confident about violet. Violet. Okay. <laughs> These numbers, let, let, you got to be able to use the information that you have available to you. These numbers down here represent the wavelength, measured in a unit called nanometers. Okay? So, you have violet light here which at about 400 nanometers, and then you have red light out here at 650 nanometers. 
Okay? So which one has a longer wavelength? Violet or red? Red. Red, much longer wavelength, right? So what do you know about longer wavelength light? Higher energy, lower energy? Lower. lower. So what this means, okay, is that when you see this red light, that's analogous to me standing up here on the chair and coming down here like this, okay? It's a very low energy transition. This blue light here, that might be from here to this chair, okay? So that might be this transition, okay? A little bit more energy, shorter wavelength, here we go. Then you got kind of this violet light transition in here, that might be up to my desk, okay? A little bit higher than the chair, not by much. Then the ultimate would be this purple line here, and that's going to be from the table down. So what you have to realize is that when you look at these spectrums, okay, you're going to, if you can figure out what energies that you have, that tells you the transitions that are taking place. So this here, low transition. Red light, not much energy. Over here, you have violet light. Now, here's what's important, okay? Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. The only reason that you have distinct bands of light, okay, if you, if you get nothing else out of today, other than what I'm about to say, this is the most important thing. Elements have distinct bands of light in their spectrums because the electrons can only absorb or emit certain amounts of energy, okay? So if you can figure out what the light is doing, you can figure out what's happening inside the electron because we can't observe the electrons directly. We can't take it, it isn't like biology, it's like, oh, let's look at an onion cell. Oh, great. We'll put it underneath the microscope. We'll give it a look. Oh, there's the nucleus. There's the cytoplasm. There's the cell wall. There's the DNA. How cool is that, right? Okay. We can't do this with, with individual atoms. We, if we can't even see an atom, there's no way to see an actual electron. Okay, can't see it. So what we do is we look at the light that's being given off. So if we can figure out what's happening with the light that's being given off, we work backwards and we figure out what's happening to the electron. So you don't get a continuous spectrum because of the fact that these electrons can only exist in certain energy levels. The more energy that there is in the transition, the shorter the wavelength. Violet light indicates a bigger transition than red light does. So what this tells me is that these electrons can only make four transitions. They can go from the ground state here, they can go to the ground state, ground state, ground state. You can only have four colors because these electrons only exist in four possible energy states. If they could exist in any possible energy state, you would get a continuous spectrum like that. So if you can figure out the light, you can figure out the electrons. Now, if you do like sodium, okay? So let's say we want to, uh, Okay, so here's the deal. So notice if you kind of remember what hydrogen looked like. Okay, hydrogen was very simple. It had four lines. Sodium is much more complex. So it has a red light. So here's the cool thing. This red light here would be the exact same energy as the red light in hydrogen. So what that tells me is that what sodium and hydrogen have in common they both have electrons that can make that same jump to make to produce that red light. 
Cool. Now, notice that sodium has green lines. Hydrogen didn't have any green lines. Hydrogen was O for the green lines. Okay, no green lines at all. So what that tells me is that sodium has electrons that have that that are in between that violet light and that red light. Oh, so electrons in sodium are capable of producing green light. They've got some yellows that sodium didn't have either. So if I don't know what the element is, and I can look at its spectral lines, this will tell me what what's going on here. So. I got green light, I got yellow. Now, the other thing is that notice these two, this, this has lines that are very, very close together, okay? So what that tells me is that these electrons, whatever they're doing, there's two electrons that have about the same energy level, but not quite. So what usually produces these are the electrons that have opposite spins. So what this tells me is that this is going to be one spin, this is going to be the other spin. So this is why we have spin up and we have spin down because that's what's producing those colors. That's why, they're so, that's why they're so close together. So what this is telling you here, this down here, is telling you the energy. So you have radio waves. Radio waves are extremely long, okay? Very, very long wavelength, very low frequency, very low energy. You have visible light. Visible light goes from violet over to red. Violet light, very high energy, red light, pretty chilled out. Then you have x-rays. So if you've ever had a broken arm and you had to have an x-ray done, okay, anybody here have an x-ray done? Okay, why do they just shine a flashlight on you? Yeah, they won't see through it. The, the, the visible light doesn't have enough energy to penetrate through your tissue, okay? X-rays do. So what takes more energy to produce, x-rays or radio waves? X-rays. X-rays. So it's very tough to produce. This is why people that are X-ray technicians, guess what? They let they wear lead aprons because they don't want to be continuously exposed to those really, really high energy photons. But here's what I want you to see. This entire spectrum, they're all photons. Okay? They are all photons. Everybody says, oh, photons are just things that you can see. This whole spectrum is photons. The only difference is whether or not we can see. We can only see a very narrow band of this entire thing. And that's cool, because if you could see x-rays, okay, then you would see, instead of like if you ever had an x-ray done, you don't see the light as coming towards your arm. If you could see x-rays, you would be able to see those x-rays coming towards your arm, just like it would be shining a light on you, okay? If you could see radio waves, okay, so instead of listening to the radio, you could see the radio waves, okay, which would be really weird. So it's actually okay that we only see a small spectrum of this part, we can only see a small part of it, because otherwise we'd be like overloaded with light, okay? It's okay that we can only see a little bit of it. Okay, all right, so stop that. So this whole thing, to a certain extent, should be a summary of what we've got. So what this is, is white light, which is what was like I showed you at the beginning. So white light can be separated out into the different colors. So notice that you've got, it all goes from reds all the way to down to violet. And it gives you the energy in photons, the wavelength in nanometers, and the speed. What do all forms of light have in common? Whether it's radio waves, x-rays, visible light, red light, violet light, doesn't make any difference. What do they all have in common? They all travel at the same speed. Okay? They all travel at the same speed. Doesn't make any difference. Okay? They all travel at the same speed. Which is why wavelength times frequency always equals 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So, some of these questions are pretty simple. It's like, okay, hey, what happens to white light when it passes through a prism? All you have to say is, oh, it just separates into its constituents. Now, don't worry about this one where it shows shading the color with colored pencils where appropriate. If you're, really, if you're really into coloring and you want to color this table, these different colors, you can. If you don't want to, that's cool too. I know you all can color, okay? But if some people really, really like to color. So if that's your thing, you can color it, okay? I'll leave that completely up. I've got colored pencils. If you want to color, I'll leave that up to you. But basically, 
this kind of takes you through everything that we have done, okay? So here's the deal. Even down here, which color corresponds to the longest wavelength? Look at the data table. Or by this point, you should be able to go, oh, it's red light. No, there we go, okay? So when you get over here to this, so what this is showing you, okay, over here on page two, this is what happens when you separate light into its colors. So what this is showing you is how you generate these spectral lines. You take the light and you separate it out. It's a sorting process, okay? That's all it is, is a sorting process. So this is, this is showing you that hydrogen spectrum, okay, which we just talked about. Then the next one down, it has boron. <clears throat> Notice that boron spectrum is much more complicated than hydrogen is because boron has a lot more electrons and therefore it has a lot more areas where these electrons can exist. So, again, on number seven where it says use colored pencils to color the hydrogen and boron spectral lines, if you really want to, you can, or you can just say it has a label. If you want to color them, color them. If you don't want to, that's cool too. That doesn't make any difference to me. So, then you're going to consider the hydrogen. You're going to look at that spectral line, so answer some questions on that. And then here's the heart and soul of this. When you get to these questions on page three, okay? So what this is, this is what's known as the Bohr model, okay? This is the planetary motion model. They said, oh, these electrons are going to exist in orbits, okay? Because they were physicists. It's like, oh, this is cool, okay? So, when you get to this first question, is energy absorbed or released for the electron transition shown in the diagram to the right? So, you're taking, when it says these N's, okay, N stands for the energy level. So, when you see like N equals 1, 2, 3, 4, that's like saying, reference back to the electron hotel, that's telling you which, which floor that you're on. So, if you see N equals 2, oh, you're on the second floor of the hotel. If n equals 4, you're on the fourth floor of the hotel. So if you want to think of this as being floors in a hotel, you can. So basically what we're saying is that you're going to take an electron on the second energy level, on the second floor of the hotel, and you're going to move that up to the fifth energy level. So are you going to put energy in or take energy out? To move an electron up, you put energy in or you take energy out? Yeah. You gotta put energy in because Mother Nature is a lazy cream it on. Mother Nature goes, you want these electrons to move? You put energy into the system. So, what it's got here, and this is what I want you to see, okay? Over here on page four, what I want you to look at is that notice on these transitions that the transitions are showing how those transitions relate to the wavelength of light. So you're going to have to tie some things together here. So notice on model A, that's the biggest energy transition. Oddly enough, that has the shortest wavelength. When you get to B, that's a little bit smaller wavelength. Oh, that's a little bit longer wavelength. When you get to C, shorter transition, longer wavelength. D, smallest transition, longest wavelength. So, again, we can't see what's happening with electrons, but we can study their light. And if we can study their light, we can figure out what the electrons are doing. Okay? Got that. Okay. You're on your own. <laughs>